Hello everyone, welcome to Your Questions on Astrology, edition 10 in this series, a very special edition. I've had questions, many questions on Varga chart, and I'm going to put together for you just two of those questions, but expand them into an in-depth analysis of the D9 Navamsa and the D60 Sastiamsha. So quite a few secrets are going to be definitely coming out on this video. But as always, don't forget everyone to post below this video if you have questions on astrology for future editions. If you're new to my channel, of course, don't forget to sub below. And if the video is good, give it a thumbs up. Let's go. So the D1, everyone, is your birth chart called Rasi chart, natal chart. The D9 is your Navamsa destiny chart and the d60 is your past life these three charts are called tri varga and these three charts must be analyzed together this is what parashara recommends d1 d9 d60 integrate them so that you will understand who you are why you are here and what is your destiny but the deeper understanding of the D1, D960 is not generally understood or what they represent as they integrate. So we need to start there to get that groundwork solid. It is generally misunderstood, I've seen. And by the way, if you don't have accurate D9, D60 for yourself, check the website bottom of my description box. Bring up these Varga charts for yourself. Do not fear as well because D60 can be difficult to get accurate. Ascendant changes every two minutes. I'm going to give you some definite way to rectify it at the end of this video as well. The D1 birth chart is a physical chart. It's the moment you were born. It's your body manifesting in this buloka, physically present. D9, however, on a very subtle level, represents the mind. The mind which is making our destiny manifest. We all know what we think is what we become. It's all coming from our mind. So, yes, moon is the mind. D1 chart, do not fear. We definitely have Chandra, Lagna, moon chart in all the Vargas. But just understand this distinction to begin with. D1 is your body. D9 is the mind. And the D60, Sasti Amsha, is the soul. Really, the D60 is you because your soul brings your karmas here. In fact, I shouldn't say your soul. You are that Atman spirit being. You have a mind, you have a body, but you are the soul. Body will be destroyed, left behind very soon, forever. Mind eventually dissolves so that you can get new body-mind incarnation happening. But the soul is eternally the same. It carries your consciousness, who you are, lifetime to lifetime. So, D1 body, D9 mind, D60 soul, this is the deep understanding. Therefore, the Lagna is the most important thing in your D1 chart. And the Kendras to that Lagna, Ascendant, because Lagna is your body, right? Become important for your physical and your mental well-being. If you have any benefits at all, one, four, seven, ten, birth chart, strengthen them. They become fortunate for you. And in the D9, you must see the moon, the most important planet to see, more than even D1 moon. And then now this gets a little bit complicated. Don't become distracted, everyone. D9 is Venus relationships. I've done a whole video on that, and I will link it below to understand that. And I'll be talking more about that in a minute. But the moon is your destiny manifesting through your mind, your mind as it is working in this life. If you want to understand your mind, you must see D9 moon. That is why any transit, particularly Saturn, Shani, to your moon D9 will change your whole destiny. In the same way, in the D60, you must see the sun. The sun is a soul. So in the D60, sun becomes the most important planet to understand why you are here. Now, another important principle I actually call Varga funnel. Now, this is not a literal funnel like this. This is a very poor uh, mundane representation of it, but you will get the actual metaphysical principle, everybody. D60 is the topmost supra conscious fine level for a good chart recommended by Parashara. And these karmas are coming in here and filtering down through these lower Varga charts. 
need to be aware that we are only consciously aware of the D1 to the D12 bar chart. Anything higher level, D30, 40, 45, any of those higher level bar charts, 20, 27, all of them, we are not aware of their operation. They're at such a fine level. But, and here's where we do gain awareness, when these D60 karmas filter down, they filter directly to the D9. The connection between the D60, D9 is very important. Karmas which you see replicated in this D9 from your D60 Sasti Amsha are extremely important for your destiny. So these replications then of D60, D9 planet sign become very ripe karmas. Let's have an example. So you've got Saturn, Virgo, D60 and you've got Saturn, Virgo, D9. When transits happen to that Saturn, Virgo, can you see they are, they are going to hit D9 and D60 together? It's very important karma, unavoidable and the Mahadasha of Saturn Bukti as well. So don't worry about house placement D60 D9. It's a sign and it's a planet replicating. Now you might ask, what if I've got sign and planet replicating D60 to the D1? Is that important? Yes, it is, but not as important as D60, D9. Why? Because D9 is our destiny. D9 is what will happen, not D1. Another very important distinction. That's why, by the way, some astrologers just say, show me the D9 chart. They don't even want to look at your, your birth chart, want to speak of any other Vargas. They just want to see D9. They just want to focus on what you're going to get. That's very superficial, isn't it? Because you will not understand who you are with our birth chart and all the other Vargas. I hope that on this channel, we're going to go far deeper than that. So with all of this in mind, everyone, let's move on to your questions. A question from Overactive Gopher then, who says, should we look at Parivartanan yogas as well as other types of yogas in the D9 chart? That will lead me on to quite a good discussion. Thank you for the question. So how to analyze D9? Let me first answer your question. Yes, a, a definite affirmative. Every yoga that you see, that you know about, is seen in all the Varga charts, including D9. But more than that. You can analyze D9, Navamsa, and indeed all Varga charts, just like you would a birth chart, in the sense that they are an actual chart. Okay, so you can see Lagna, Lord Houses, First Lord Houses, Seventh Lord Houses, all of those things. You can do all of that analysis, but the difference is in the interpretation, because you have to take context of the actual Varga chart. Be aware what you are actually looking at. You see, everybody, fundamentally, in every single Varga chart, including D9, Ascendant is you. How you relate to the factors of that chart. So D9 chart, Ascendant is how you relate to your fortune, Bhagya, because that's the most fundamental factor of it your fortune, your destiny, but also to your spouse. But here's the tricky thing about the D9, everybody. Have you thought about this? D9 isn't just one thing, like D10, career, profession. It's very cut and dry, isn't it? What work you're going to do in this life. But D9 is about spouse. That's another person and you your destiny and spouse, and they don't necessarily go together exactly. Okay, so this is why analyzing D9 is always a little bit tricky. And this is precisely why, everybody, you have to cross-analyze D1, D9 using specific techniques. You have to be very systematic about it. Otherwise, you're going to get confused. You can't just grab D9 and say, let me analyze D9. You need to have specific techniques. And those techniques I've already given you on that D9 original video. Definitely check it out after this one. I would advise, again, link below, link at the end. But right now... We're going to go into some even deeper secrets, which you can add to those I've already given you. First thing, do not neglect the moon in D9. I've just shown you D9 is the mind. Moon is the mind. So understanding how your mind is actually manifesting destiny according to your past actions, 
you can see so much from this Moon D9. First thing then, check the sign. Check the video on my channel, Moon Karma's All Signs. If, you, if you've not already checked your D9 moon there, you must do. It is driving your focus in this whole incarnation. And certainly check the house of your moon D9. I'm going to give you a very good example in a minute because that moon house is going to be central to what interests you, what you focus on, what you are going to pursue through this whole incarnation. Check Lord of that sign. Where has he gone in that D9? You are pulled to that area as well. It's a karmic factor you cannot avoid in any circumstance. A bit deeper analysis. Moon in your D9 is the Chandramsa. In fact, moon in every Varga chart is so central because moon manifests our whole experience in this material world. And in the D9 chart, what is the moon manifesting? A, your fortune, Bagya. Secondly, your spousal relationship. Therefore, to understand destiny in this incarnation and spousal relationship, relationships generally, everyone, you must see planets conjuncting the moon with the moon, same sign, opposition to the moon and aspecting the moon. But particularly with the moon opposing, these become very central. We need to understand that any planet, not just Rahu Ketu, any Graha with the moon D9 is eclipsing your mind, is having a profound effect on your experience in this life. You see, everyone, Moon says so much about emotional experience in relationship and integration with society because spouse comes from within society. Now, everyone, when you have malefics, therefore, with this Moon D9, same sign, this can be Saturn, Mars, Rahu, Ketu, even the Sun, you're going to get some challenging emotional relationship experiences. Definitely going to be there in at least one relationship we can see. For example, Moon with Saturn. By the way, Moon Saturn can delay marriage sometimes, but generally it's a restricting factor. Spouse can be difficult, cold, challenging, controlling, even at the worst case cruel, but that is definitely not always going to be there. But they are controlling you, constricting you. You don't feel free emotionally in at least one relationship. But Moon with Saturn wants the relationship. Moon Saturn makes you cling on, hold on, want to maintain it no matter what. Saturn's patience. You will have endless patience trying to make really impossible relationships work sometimes. That's okay because sometimes there is benefit at the end if you stay calm, patient. I have, I have actually seen this manifest. But emotionally, it's certainly highly challenging. Moon with Mars, you become challenged emotionally. There can be violence sometimes, difficulty, hurt there. And it can be physical, actually, occasionally. But you have to see the sign dispositor. You can't just say Moon, Mars, violent relationship. It isn't going to happen. But the emotions become tempestuous, argumentative, somewhat violent, heady emotions, definitely, in at least, as I say, one relationship. Rahu with the moon, that can be deception, difficulty going outside of the borders, foreign spouse, definitely traveling, meeting spouse, all of those things. K2, that can be some coldness coming in, some detachment emotionally happening. Sun with the moon, it's a bit like Amavasya, turns you inwards, makes you a little bit introverted, but you have to open up to the spouse. Sometimes spouse can be burning effect on your mind, create disturbance, or can be totally dominating either way. Even benefics with the moon eclipse the mind. If there is affliction to that moon benefic conjunction, moon Venus, moon Jupiter, moon Mercury, there can be disturbance. Venus with the moon, Jupiter with the moon expands opportunity to meet spouse. Definitely many opportunities, maybe too many. Who do you choose? Moon Venus can be helpful, though, giving financial benefits from the spouse sometimes. But there can be over sensuality, as I say, over expansion relationships. So many opportunities, even within the relationship, if there is affliction. Something else you have to see. 
And of course, Moon Jupiter, even even though Jupiter can give good fortune, blessings here, he will definitely give over expansion, lack of discrimination, even a first can happen because he's just pushing forward all the time, more relationships, more opportunities. Moon Mercury spouse could be changeable, bored, even a bit flirty in society. Definitely a little bit immature sometimes. I've seen sometimes. And definitely it, it will give domestic and general instability. Because friendship, relationships, there's a very fine border between them sometimes. When you have Moon Mercury, definitely need intellectual compatibility with the spouse. It becomes crucial. Now, what about planets opposing the moon? Same thing happens as I've just spoken for all of those grahas because it's coming from society to you. But be aware, seventh from the moon is not the spouse in the D9. It's spouse coming to you from society. Where those opportunities come for you to actually meet the spouse. When the actual graha conjuncts the moon, that's how the spouse impacts. Second thing, see the exaltation, debilitation of any planet D9. Magnify glass over that, definitely. It's very important. Any exalted planet, such as Sun, Aries, Jupiter, Cancer, any of those, you are going to get good fortune from that graha at some point. Maybe Markadasha Bhukti, but you're definitely going to have it. Even if it's ill-placed, at some point, you're definitely going to have fortune because exalted planet is like Vishnu. It's purity coming from past life karma. But in the opposite way, any debilitation of any planet D9 causes you temptation to go away from Dharma, righteous action, purity and you have to be careful you can take shortcuts and cause yourself ill fortune so watch debilitated planets very carefully watch actions that you actually take around their significations just like Saturn Aries D9 can be a little bit boastful sometimes not even telling total truth of the situation because you are impatient a little bit boastful even just wanting things to go your way definitely lacking staying ability this is a thing so you get huge frustration with this and it can lead to definitely undharmic behavior Another example, let's say you've got Venus in debilitation, Venus Virgo D9, then you've got a habit past life of treating women not well, not respectfully, etc. You have to see all of those aspects, karmas in there, but definitely whether you are male or female, watch how you treat women in this very lifetime or it's going to cause you difficulty. You get the point. Another big destiny changing factor is planets in the Marana Karakastana position D9. This means everyone when you have the Sun 12th house, Moon 8th house, Mercury 4th, 7th, Venus in the 6th house, Mars in the 7th, Jupiter 3rd, Saturn 1st, Rahu 9th or K2 in the 4th. These are the Marana Karakastana death-like situations. Planets are struggling. It's going to impact you strongly means that some karmas in relation to these grahas, including Rahu Ketu, were not integrated properly last life and they just don't work for you. But here's the good news. They can come out of this position as well. Check the video on my channel, Marana Karakastana. I've gone into an in-depth analysis of every single one of these placements and how they come out of this. So check it carefully. Once again, the link is below. Next, to understand, analyze D9, you must understand the houses in the D9, right? Now, here's the really important understanding. Just like all Varga charts, D9 is a superimposed mirror image on your D1 birth chart. What this means is that the D9 being the ninth chart is about the ninth house D1. It's about the fortune house due to your past life karmas. Fortune comes to us from our deeds. Which deeds? Past life deeds. Therefore, Ascendant D9 has a ninth house implication. It's the ninth house Dharma. Ascendant is you, but it has ninth house Dharmic implications. 
In the same way, the fifth house in your D9 chart is actually relating to you, your intelligence, how you make decisions. And the ninth house D9 relates to the fifth house of the D1 chart. It's about children in a way, definitely. It's about mantra, deep spiritual wisdom, guru's knowledge, how you teach as well. And it's definitely about education. So, you can judge all of the houses like this. And I've already given you a deep analysis of every one of these D9 houses in my original video. As I say, link below. For example, very important one to understand is that the 12th house D9 is your longevity because it relates to the 8th house, as you can see here. But let's go even a little bit deeper now. This video, let's see what the 14710 actually show you about direction in your life. So here we have the four paths of material existence mapped directly onto your D9 chart. You should study these carefully. Ascendant is Dharmic path. Fourth house is your Moksha path. Seventh house is the Kama or material pleasure enjoyment path. And 10th house is the author or material sustenance wealth. So the first house in your D9, Ascendant D9, represents dharmic action coming from your past life. So when you've got benefics here, any benefic like Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, definitely you and and the moon, by the way, but the moon needs to be strong D1. That's it. A bright moon coming in here. You will definitely have fortune in your life. And it's coming from your past good deeds. You can be ethical person, hopefully, unless there is malefic affliction. But be careful, everyone, when you have malefics in your D9 ascendant. What it means is that there is some difficult karma coming back because of past life unethical action. You see, Saturn here can make you not always truthful sometimes, depends on the sign, of course, because Saturn is about lies. And in this D9 Ascendant, be honest, be forthright, otherwise going to impact relationships. Or I've seen definitely Saturn D9 Ascendant makes you fearful about relationship due to past life experience. Let's take another malefic. So you've got Mars first house. You can be aggressive, pushy, forceful because of past life actions coming here again. But it doesn't help dharmic action. You have to watch it carefully. It can impact impulsivity and quarrels, difficulty, relationships. What should you do? Any malefic first house, go for the higher standard. If you've got Rahu first house, check out Rahu. Good karma. Be ethical with the with the non-humans, he, he represents them. You were not last life, now you must be. If you've got Saturn here, be truthful, hardworking, patient. If you've got Mars, fight, that's for sure. You're going to have to fight, but fight for the righteous cause. You get the idea. Now, as I've said, fourth house D9 is the Moksha Liberation Bhava, but it's a Jala Water Bhava, very emotional, sensitive place fourth house D9. If there are malefics here, even afflicting, it can affect health. More than anything, fourth house D9 affects your health. So take remedies of these planets generally. That can help. But the most important thing is watch Mahadasha for your physical well-being. Really, it's about regulating emotion. What you will find is Planets in this fourth house get your emotions to a really high level by their karaka significance. So let's say you've got Mars here, then your emotions are being affected by anger, perhaps internalized anger, depending on the sign. It's affecting everything, how you relate to others, because it's your D9 chart. So you've got to regulate anger. Bring it, bring it out constructively. Don't hide it because this can definitely affect physical and, and even mental health. So for your stability, any malefic here needs to be looked at carefully and definitely stabilize emotions. Saturn here, stabilize fear. K2 here, stabilize your detachment. Don't be so harsh on the other people in your life. Rahu, stabilize your greed. You get the idea. 
Now, the seventh house, D9, definitely represents spouse first relationship. Spoken about all of that in my original video. Let's go deeper now. This is the Kama house. This is your desire, your enjoyment. You want to enjoy the spouse. You want sexual intercourse. You see, this is the third house mapping to your D1 chart. I've just shown you. Ascendant, second house, third house. So, this house is about how much pleasure you are actually going to get in your relationships, but even in your whole lifetime. It's about getting enjoyment. So, for example, benefics being here can be helpful on one level. You get that pleasure. Venus here, you'll definitely get it in some way, but watch out for sign affliction. Venus, seventh house, D9, you can get a very good looking spouse, by the way. That's another factor. Tenth house in your D9, it represents money. The money you get because of your good deeds, past life. So this is destined wealth. When you have benefics placed here, any benefic, particularly moon though, check D1, it definitely needs to be a increasing bright moon there. But Venus, Jupiter, Mercury, sometimes you are going to get wealth. At some point, it's flowing to you because of your past life deeds. Let's pull all of these techniques together. These new techniques I've just spoken about by looking at a chart. Let's see King Charles III of England. By the way, a full analysis of his chart is already up on my channel. Let's start by looking at the moon. Here is the moon in the D9 chart. Now, the moon is in Gemini. Very important. Don't forget, natal moon is in Aries personality. Very, very fiery person. Very, very abrupt sometimes. Certainly full of enthusiasm with Rahu. Perhaps difficult to live with. He can be a bit snappy, impatient. We've even seen him acting like that in public. It's definitely moon Aries personality. But at a deeper level, karmic level, this moon Gemini, Gemini says so much more about Charles III. His mind is super intellectual, Gemini, very much about curiosity, research, ninth house with Jupiter. Definitely, he's an explorative person. He's a widely read person, definitely. But what is he interested in? The ninth house, religion. One thing has always been certain about Charles, a deep interest in philosophy, religion, all religions. He studied all of them actually deeply. He has a deep curiosity, wants to know about them, understand them morally and spiritually. Even in his coronation, there was all cultures there represented, religions as well. He was very keen for that to happen. He even wanted to be called king of, of all the faiths. It wasn't going to happen, but he desired it. That's the thing. So because Jupiter is here, he has a big interest in Dharma, in philosophy, in faith systems, definitely. But is he steady in them? Gemini does not give steadiness. It's a weak place to have Guru, actually. And the other thing, where has the actual Lord gone of this D9 moon? The Lord Mercury has gone into Aquarius, challenging placement, Rahu, Saturn, lead, and fifth house. Mercury, fifth house, D9, many love affairs, many pleasures, many diversions. So that's another factor. Of course, Charles has two planets with the moon eclipsing the mind. Now, these need some little analysis here. Jupiter opens up many relationships. It's the Lord of the seventh from, from the moon, come to the moon. He has no lack of willing partners. Definitely, he was a prince, don't forget. But definitely, he was spoiled for choice. But the sun with the moon is a difficult factor. I've just spoken about that. Sun with the moon is a burning factor. Something is burning in a relationship for him. Which relationship? Well, I would say definitely Diana. It was difficult for him. It's burning his mind. He is not settled there. 
Of course, the other factor of this moon sun is that it burns this house with an Amavasya darkening effect on his mind. Actually, it makes him introverted, inward person for some time and definitely harms relationship with father because this is in the ninth house of the chart. And that was a definite fact. He had a very difficult relationship with Prince Philip. In the D9 chart, King Charles doesn't have any exaltation or debilitation of planets, but he does have K2 in a modern Akarakastana in the fourth house. It's the actual house of emotions, the Moksha house. So he's looking for some liberation, K2 there, but his emotions are constricted and this can affect health for Charles as well. Now the actual four directions, one, four, seven, ten. We can see he wants to do dharmic action. Venus has gone to the tenth house, but it's with Rahu Saturn. He becomes restricted from it. He feels restricted in his ambitions. Rahu Saturn has made Charles wait a long, long time to become king. Of course, the lord of this seventh house, representing first wife, Princess Diana, has gone 12 to itself, divorce, separation, contention, minimum. He's not getting pleasure there. So, where does he get pleasure satisfaction? He gets it from the second wife. Why? Because eight houses away is the second marriage. Camilla Parker Bowles, Lord Mars again, but this time five houses away. He gets the pleasure satisfaction from this relationship. But he might have got pleasure with Camilla, but he got complication as well, by the way, because K2 is co-lord, three houses away, love affairs, complications, separations, it was all happening. Spoken about it in the chart analysis on my channel. It was extremely complicated, karmic relationship. And what about the Arthur Bava? Will he get wealth? Yes, a benefic is here, as I've spoken about on the video. And it is Lord of this whole D9 chart. He will definitely get that. And it is inherited as well, because Venus is the Lord of the 8th house of inheritance. Now, D60 question. Uh, this has come from Tijal about four months ago, but you know, many of you have asked about D60. It's quite popular, isn't it? How to analyze D60 chart for overall life aspects. Yes, can't go into too much detail here, but I will give you some definite secrets and I will do a full video for you. Do not fear. And an example to show how D60 supersedes over all other charts, even D9 charts. You're pretty confident of that, right? Thanks. Okay, so let's look at the D60. So the first thing then is we've got to rectify the D60 chart. Even if you think you've got accurate time of birth, you must try this technique to be absolutely sure. Because ascendant D60 changes every two minutes and we want that ascendant to be very exact. Otherwise, we cannot make many of the judgments I'm going to show you. You should see K2 sign D60. That won't change so fast. So generally, if you've got a fairly accurate time of birth, see sign of K2 in your D60. Now, this technique comes from Pandit Sanjay Rath. And there are other techniques as well. I do not deny. But this one I have found definitely helpful. Once you've found K2 sign D60, don't forget K2 is our past life karma, dropping us literally into this incarnation with all of that parabdala karma ready to be experienced. So check K2 sign and then find the Lord of that sign. Don't forget some signs have more than one Lord. And what has to happen is that the Lord of this K2 signs or one of the Lords, if there is if there is more than one like Aquarius, Rahu, Saturn, must aspect by Rasi sign aspect, not sight, the D60 Ascendant. So let's say K2 is in Capricorn in your D60. Saturn is the Lord. Saturn must aspect by sign aspect the D60 Ascendant. So it's not third aspect, 10th aspect, but sign aspect. Now, just in case you're not sure, everyone, these are how the Rasi sign aspects go. Cardinal signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, aspect, fixed signs, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, and vice versa, except for the sign adjacent. Example, say you've got planet in Aries sign, that will certainly 
aspect rossi aspect leo scorpio aquarius but not taurus because taurus is next sign to aries that is the exception and then with the other four signs dual signs that means gemini virgo sagittarius pisces they will aspect each other there is no exception so here we have charles iii's chart let's confirm in this way if this is accurate sastiamsha by this actual birth time given so where is k2d60 it's in cancer easy one lord the moon does the moon aspect d60 ascendant it does it is actually in that sign that's all we need to know human body this is charles iii's accurate d60 let's have another example let's look at madonna's chart generally we see that capricorn comes up as her d60 lagna most times with her birth time as given now is this accurate no it doesn't work at all why because k2 is in leo dispositor the sun is in gemini gemini is a dual sign it has no rassi aspect onto capricorn ascendant so let's adjust the time that's why this deva guru is really really helpful actually taking this d60 forward we can try out aquarius lagna is it going to work it's only a minute or so different no because k2 is in leo still lord is is the sun sun is still gemini gemini does not aspect by rassi aspect the fixed sign of aquarius let's have another go let's go back a minute or so we get sagittarius is this going to work as her rectified ascendant it does look because k2 is in leo the sun is a dispositor in gemini directly aspecting ascendant by rassi aspect because dual sign gemini aspects dual sign sagittarius so madonna's core personality sagittarius mars i would say definitely it's a battle like personality sagittarius is the battlefield mars is a warrior she's a warrior type core personality i would say this is definitely correct so now you've got a rectified d60 how do we analyze it everybody well the first thing to understand what does it show the d60 shows a specific parabola karmas coming down into that funnel i've shown you beginning of the video which are going to manifest in this lifetime and more specifically the d60 represents your last human incarnation not from ascendant ascendant and all of those houses d60 show how that karma is going to impact this lifetime i'm going to show you in a minute how to see the exact human form itself and all those events happen to you but right now understand that the d60 chart shows you last human incarnation that might have been a long time ago in this bull buloka for many of us don't forget half of the time we do not have the opportunity to incarnate into this precious human form it's a rarity not a common factor and this is why everybody we have to do dharmic actions pure actions we have to avoid all of those negative actions which take us down into lower life forms not to preach but this is what it's really all about we have to understand this understand this reincarnation cycle we are all eternally part of until eventually hopefully we can attain liberation so what do we see when we see ascendant d60 we see our deep soul personality from many incarnations actually human incarnations showing us tendencies there very often this becomes obvious as a baby as an as an infant because we naturally show this later it can become more subdued but it's very important transits to this d60 lagna are really important and to any graha there it becomes seminal in addition i've seen mahadasha of any planet rising in your d60 sastiamsha it's a huge turning point in your whole destiny even bhukti periods of that same planet now for sure d60 has 60 amshas and 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 each one has a special deity you may know about this not the place to go into that here but they can show definite tendencies definite karmic impact but that's for a whole different analysis 
Next analysis, see the rising sign, Lord Lagna, Lord, or don't forget, sometimes there is more than one of your D60 Lagna. And see that in the D60 chart itself. It actually tells us quite a lot about your path in this life. So in your D60 chart, if the Lagna Lord, Lord of your rising sign, has gone into the first house, fifth house, ninth house, you have come here to do dharmic action. You have come here to do some good deeds. You're going to have to fulfill them. It's an absolute necessity part of of your destiny and you have come here to get knowledge maybe education as well if the d60 lagna lord has gone into the second house d60 sixth house or tenth house these are the arthur houses you come here to get wealth your destiny is to create wealth it is a big big desire for you but also it is part of your unfinished karmas something which you have to complete if the Lagna Lord D60 has gone into the third house, D60, seventh house, eleventh house, you've come here for pleasure. This is difficult because you're going to get yourself entwined into these three, seven, eleven. You're going to have a lot of free will this lifetime, but don't misuse it. You're going to be able to manifest things you would like to manifest. I've seen Lagna Lord three, seven, eleven in this D60 chart. But you can go over the top. Be careful that you don't entwine yourself in some difficult karmas, particularly relationship-wise. If the Lagna Lord D60 has gone into the 4th house, D60, 8th house or 12th house of your D60 chart, moksha is your goal. It doesn't matter what else is happening. Relationship, work-wise, fame, not fame, anything. Deep down in your soul, D60 is your soul. You want to liberate yourself. You're going to get knowledge helping you on that path most definitely. The sun in your D60, most important planet. I just explained that beginning of the video, why that is. So the sun D60, your soul's desire, your soul's purpose here. How do you see it? Sign position of the sun D60, house position. If, if you need some help with that, definitely check out the video on my channel, Sun Karma's All Signs. Apply it to your D60 in this context of your soul desire for this incarnation and for the house placement definitely check out playlist on my channel sun in all the houses nearly finished at the point i'm actually making this video it will apply most definitely to your past life karmas and your deeper soul needs in this incarnation now, what about your exact last human life? Who were you? What did you do? What actually happened to you? Can you see that, D60? You definitely can. But you don't see it from the ascendant D60. That is about karmas affecting you this life from the past. Okay, that's a very clear distinction I've tried to show. You see the last human life from the Aruda Lagna in the D60. So you need a really good software showing you that. Certainly, Dave, a guru will do that. Link below, of course. But what you need to know is that you have to have a really accurate ascendant. That's why you must rectify D60 ascendant because the Aruda Lagna comes from that ascendant D60. So when you got that D60 Lagna accurate, put a big circle around the Aruda Lagna, the AL in that D60 chart. That was your last life ascendant. As I say, may not be accurately what it was, but it definitely shows who you were. Read the whole chart from there. You can do an in-depth analysis, everybody, from that Aruda Lagna, of course, just as you would do for any birth chart. I will give you an example in a minute. Final point, Mahadasha and the D1, D9, D60 together. How do we see final result of Mahadasha using this Trivaga technique? Of course, if you're not sure how to actually read Mahadasha, Mahadasha Lord, Bhukti Lord, check the whole playlist on my channel, how to read Mahadasha, that will surely help you. Certainly, when you see difficult Mahadasha Bhukti period of any two planets, let's, let's say you're in Sun Mahadasha Mars Bhukti, and say they're in a 6-8 relationship, D1, D9, 
but they're in a 1-5 good relationship. D60, D60 will have the final say, bring you out of that. On the other hand, if you've got a good Mahadasha Lord book D, D1, D9 relationship, it's not so good D60, D60 will have final say and there will be difficulties. That's how you do it. Let's look at Charles III, D60. It's very interesting, everybody. We've just confirmed accurately that it is Gemini, Lagna, Mars, the Moon. His whole personality is this rather, let's say, agitated, forceful, but definitely intellectually curious person from many human births. And the Lagna Lord D60 has gone into the eighth house, one of the moksha houses. He is seeking spiritual wisdom liberation on some level, definitely. But check out, it's with Jupiter Rahu, Guru Chandal Yoga. He can be misled. He can be distracted from the path. That can be seen as well. Now, the sun shows why he's here. Soul, why is it here? It's here because he wants to be king. I am telling you, I can see this karma very clearly. The sun is in the Aruda Lagna past life situation. We can go into it in a minute. But the sun and Saturn together, there was, there was some loss of status past life. He has come to reclaim it. His desire is to rule. The sun is in Leo. Big soul desire. Now, very important, at the beginning of the video, if you didn't see it, check it out now, I explained about the Varga funnel, how the karmas come down from the D60 past life into the D9 directly, and they're definitely happening here. What we see then is that the moon in the D60 chart is in Gemini, and that moon is replicated in the D9. This is D9 chart here. So, moon in Gemini, D60, same sign, D9. Something else, Venus Cancer in the D60, Venus Cancer, D9. These are the big karmas for Charles III. The Venus is very important. Venus represents lost past life. It's in the 12th house to his personality, who he actually was, human birth. Some loss has occurred. Loss of status. It's the 10th from the Aruda Lagna. I hope you're with me. And it's in the, the 10th house of the D9. He's going to get that status back. So what happened in his Venus Mahadasha? In Venus Mahadasha, he was invested in a big ceremony as the Prince of Wales. First crown went onto his head when he was 21. Huge change in his status. And during his moon Mahadasha, that's when he married Princess Diana. Life-changing karmas and he had two sons. Why are they life-changing? Because the moon is in the ascendant D60. I've spoken about this. Planet Ascendant D60 are going to definitely impact you, changing your whole direction, making many important things happen that are destined to happen when the moon is replicating D9. So this relationship with Diana was destined to happen, coming from past life karma, past life situation, definitely. But this replicated moon, everybody, so powerful, is bringing another relationship. I've already spoken, Saturn transits the moon, D9. Everybody's destiny changes. When he married Camilla Parker Bowles, Saturn was in Gemini 2005. So this moon Gemini here, D60, moon Gemini, D9, karma's destiny change once again. Now, last human birth, the Aruda Lagna of the D60 is in Leo, the sign of the king. This is so interesting. Was he a he or she? There is a way to find out. Some astrologers have different methods. Some say if it's a masculine sign, Leo is a masculine sign, he was a man. Okay, we'll just leave it there. So, Sun, Saturn shows enormous status sun leo ascendant type experience he had status maybe he was a prince maybe he was a ruler maybe he was a king but he lost it saturn shows loss why because saturn is modern akarakastana first house of this past life last human birth and it is destroying the sun destroying kingship power destroying rulership 
on who is doing this destruction enemy because saturn is the lord of the sixth house of the enemies gone into this first house and the seventh house of the open enemies warfare what else can we see? I'm not going to go into an exact house by house deep analysis, but just looking at it, there's some definite battles taking place. Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter in the Capricorn sign, the, the definite graveyard battle, war happening, disturbances, relationship. Rahu is spouse, gone 12th here into the graveyard, maybe death. And definitely looking at this status, 10th house, Venus has gone 12th house he has definitely sacrificed relationship venus here 12th house maybe lost a marriage lost a relationship there's been battles happening legal factors disturbances loss of status even renunciation venus k2 12th house he's had a very disturbed last human birth but he's come to reclaim some of those karmas i would say because we can see that this venus has gone to his ascendant now he's going to get back fortune of this 12th house venus maybe some relationship he lost has definitely come again maybe some status he lost he has finally reclaimed Hope the video was good for you on your screen right now. Don't forget to check out more deep secrets of the D9 and Mahadasha. If you're new to my channel, don't forget to sub below. Goodbye for now. God bless you all.